guys. I've met some people that are actually building stuff uh, that will fly to the moon. Uh, it's amazing. It's all done in you know at home in small uh, offices. And we what we've tried to do there is uh, create, let's say, the environment for um, for everyone to just become creative and create a concept, create an idea. So we will have 3D printers, we will have Arduino boards, we will have Raspberry Pis, we will have uh, Mat MATLAB licenses. So you have the opportunity over the entire weekend to just go mental. Uh, and that's uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, in terms of sponsorship, um, uh, yeah, we, <laughs> uh, we, we have approached uh, many people. Um, We've approached ESA, so they, they're supporting us. Uh, one of the prizes will be uh, uh, given by ESA. Uh, we have Airbus on board. Uh, uh, we're working on OHB. Uh, <laughs> we're proving a bit difficult. Um, we have uh, Space Catapult, and then we, we have really the city of Bremen that was very supportive of the, of the idea, and that uh, we're, we're very happy that we approached them to, to do this thing in Bremen. So. So uh, we have three different ticket types. We have the engineer and science tickets, we have the non-engineer, non-science tickets, and then we had the designers, the creative people. Uh, we split them up into different uh, ratios. So currently we have about 45 technical people. So that includes sciences, engineering, and uh, this lot. And then we have about, I think, 14, 15, um, yeah, non-engineers, non-scientists, and then we're expecting about 10 designers and creative people. So it's a very mixed group of people. And I think the best ideas come when you bring together these interdisciplinary aspects of the group. Definitely, um, we're gonna have to have very short questions, but you can continue questions for the other coffee times and uh, during tonight's dinner as well. Um, we're gonna move to the next presentation, but thank you very, very much. Uh, if I can grab that one, thank you. Uh, so we're going to move on to the crew perspective of NEMO, uh, which is going to be presented by Over. Thank you. <coughs> okay. So... Um, I had already the opportunity just after the, the NEMO 19 mission in which I participated in September to have a, <coughs> a talk with you and to discuss about, <coughs> sorry, about the feedback uh, and what about this mission is and so on. What I would like to share with you, you have a bunch of pictures, but it will be an open talk and you, there will be time for questions, is to share about uh, what you feel from a crew perspective and how close these missions are to a real space mission. Because for me, it was really a kind of amazing feeling that I was, I was overwhelmed by what you can learn through this mission. So the first point that you learn as a, as a crew is the training pressure. So I'm an instructor. You have seen plenty of other instructors. You have heard this morning instructors saying, yeah, sometimes the crew, they are not really, uh, they, they don't want to hear with, about what I say because they say it's not important and so on. The crew actually for the ISS, when they are in uh, ISS training, they have they are under huge pressure because they have to learn a lot of things uh, at different locations and they cannot remember everything. And they are overwhelmed by the information and their main concern is I have to keep in mind only what is important for me. For NEMO, we had exactly the same uh, phenomen phenomena. So um, we had a training, two weeks of training. Of course, the activity was not as complex as on board the space station. The space station. But what happened is that in these two weeks, you are overwhelmed by information. Uh, the timeline is very, uh, very uh, dense, and what you want to know is only to get to uh, what is necessary for you to recall. So, and you, I, I, I found myself in a strange mode that I have seen plenty of time when I was teaching an astronaut or when colleagues were teaching an astronaut. That you, you in the first, in the first ten, ten minutes, minutes of, of the presentation, presentation, you try to assess: is it important for me or not? And if it is important, you listen. If it's not so important, you have maybe a tendency to say, okay, now I relax a bit and uh, I have other things to do. And this is a strange feeling for me to feel this feeling. It was a strange feeling for me to feel this from the other side of 
of, of the, 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 crew, uh, the crew fence. Second aspect <coughs> is the danger, the safety. So what, what is very important for these simulations, like Nemo, uh, is that this, these are very dangerous conditions. You are put in a situation where you are at risk. You are fully uh, saturated uh, for days, uh, under the water at uh, 20 meters. If something happens to you, you cannot, you know that it's forbidden to go to surface. If you go to surface, you die. So if you do an EV outside and you have the umbilical attaching you to the, to the module, you want to make sure that you don't become positive buoyant and go to the surface because maybe the umbilical will be long enough, will not be long enough, to, or short enough to, to prevent you to go up. And if you go there, there is no way. You will get the bends and you die. Another situation is if you want to go to the toilets. I mean, the toilets are outside. Uh, this is a kind of, uh, uh, they call it the gazebo. So it's a kind of uh, reversed uh, uh, compartment with air inside. And this is where you, you, you go when you need. But when you go there, it's outside the module. So you have to take your mask, your fins, you get out of the module, and with the hand, you try to reach the other side. So it's easy to do, but if you are not careful enough, and you find yourself in the middle between the two, you go to surface, and then you have to be very careful to go back with your fins, or you can die. Especially if you go, if you have a boat outside during the day, of course they can save you because they have a barrel chamber on, on the boat. But if it's in the evening, nobody will save you. The time they come, that's the end. So, also in the, in the, when you do a dive, when you prepare everything, uh, you have a lot of procedures to follow, and uh, when you equip your, your body uh, with all these helmets and so on, it can be very, uh, I mean, every step is very important. And you have to take care of the safety of your crewmate, because you know that if you do something which is, you don't check something as expected, it can, have, it can become critical and have very bad consequences. So you are very concerned with, uh, with the safety of your crew, and you know when it's your turn that they are very concerned with your safety. And this ob obliges the people to be very careful with all the procedures, and to take it serious, and to be very, very careful with all the safety aspects. So, and this, this is something that you would not have if you would have a kind of simulation outside, and suddenly you say, okay, simulation is ended, I get out, and uh, I go back home, and I come back in, in, on the next day. Uh, and this is where you learn, uh, you learn to work like on board the space station, or how to handle, how to behave with your crew, crewmates, how to handle the procedures, how to handle the, 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 safety, uh, the safety checklist, and so on. Then um, there is uh, another aspect in the safety that uh, what is, was surprising, that the, the main safety problem that we could have inside the, the module was like on the space station. You can have a fire, you can have a contamination of atmosphere, uh, you can have uh, decompression. If you have a decompression, the module gets flooded. And we have been trained on that, and we knew, we knew that uh, there could be an alarm at a certain point of time, and we have less than uh, 20 minutes or 15 minutes to get out, either through the wet porch, or if we cannot reach, there is another, another door that you open in the, in the sleeping compartment, where you have some uh, diving equipment, you, you put this on, and you go directly to the gazebo as a safe haven. And then you wait from the boat to come uh, to rescue you, and uh, they could take only two guys at a time, two or three, depend, it depends. The guys will be brought to the harbor in the hyperbaric chamber, then they will be transferred to a bigger hyperbaric chamber, and then the boat will get to rescue the other ones. So you, you know that you have this kind of Damocles sword on, on the head every time, uh, and that you have to be ready to react even if it's in the middle of the night. Uh, what happened also is that any kind of tiny little thing, like you get a scratch, you get a lot of scratches, but in the atmosphere of the module where everything is wet, when it's high temperature, uh, this can be infected very fast. I mean, the bacteria, they love this very well. So, and we are, we are very careful with that, that uh, because otherwise it can become painful, and then uh, we wanted to avoid that someone could go uh, outside in emergency mode and be brought back. So then there was, there is a timeline, and the timeline is exactly as on the space station. This is smart because the guys who build the mission, they build it the same way. They put you under pressure with a timeline which is so packed that you feel exactly the same situation that an astronaut feels when he arrives or she arrives on the space station, at least for the first weeks. Uh, what happened is that uh, 
to give you uh, an example, the, the work uh, zone was between uh, 7.30 to, uh, in the morning to 7.30 in the afternoon, uh, in, in, in the night. And in between, you can have only five minutes break. And it's not a lot. And what happened the first day? You run behind schedule. You do your work, and of course, things are not going as you expect. So you are late, you, you try to catch up, you are late, you are late, and at the end, you are under pressure, and you don't like this. And I recall that I, re I have reported that to the, to the commander the first uh, evening and said, okay, I'm, I, I don't feel good because I was running under, under my timeline the full day, and, and this is uncomfortable. And he had, he had a big smile on the face and said, hey, Hervé, welcome in the astronaut world. This is exactly what we have on the space station. And this is why this training is very important. And then he gave me recommendations and the way to do it is, when you wake up in the morning at 6 o'clock, you don't start to wake up to get your coffee, to have a talk, and then you say, now it's time to work. When you open your eyes, the first objective is, where can I get 5 minutes, 10 minutes to be ahead of my timeline? And if you get 10 minutes at the end of the day, you are happy. Just to avoid this feeling. Then you have also something which is, which is very uh, similar, is uh, that you lose objects. So you have heard on the station that you, they lose objects uh, everywhere uh, because they float around, they, they float through a module, the objects, the objects are, are getting detached and it's difficult to find them. You couldn't tell me how can you f uh, lose an object in such a module. I mean, it's tiny, it's small, but it's just because it's small and packed with a lot of objects that we have to use for the mission that we lose them. The, the way it happens is that you need something, you have something that you need. You put it somewhere and you know that it's here. You go out uh, somewhere else and you do another job. When you come back, the object is no more there. The reason is either it was disturbing another crew member because we are so packed that it happens quite often, or the another crew member needed this object, used it, and put it in on, on another place because this place was not uh, free anymore. So you spend a lot of time like, where are my stuff? Where are and looking for it. And you cannot ask the, all the crew members, did, who has touched it? Uh, did you do that? Did you do this? This is, this is not possible. So you have to develop a strategy to uh, always think where the things are, the, the objects are, verifying where they are all the time. Uh, then uh, another aspect is um, the, how, you, how, you feel, how you feel bad uh, when you don't do, when the, the, let's say an experiment that you perform is not done as expected you feel really frustrated, and not because uh, you, cons you, 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 you consider this is your fault. And the first thing, anyway, you think, is it my fault? Did I do something wrong? But the, the feeling that you think about all the people who have put effort in it, all, all the people who are prepared, trained, who have developed the experiment, uh, the expectations, and this doesn't go as, as we expect. And each of us, it happened during the mission, when we went through experiments, we didn't go uh, uh, in a, as expected. We were frustrated, and we could see in the face on our, on our uh, uh, crewmates that the, the, the guys were, were not happy. So, um, very important also, and this will be maybe the, the last thing I will mention before opening to question, the connection to the outside, to you guys, to the PR, to the family. I mean, you feel completely isolated, uh, even if it's a small duration. Each time you have the possibility to talk to the outside, to uh, share things, I mean, this makes your, your day. I mean, otherwise, if there is a PR, a PR communication that, that, that fails or doesn't work as expected, you are in a bad mood for the rest of the day, or your crew member will be in a bad mood. So we, know, we knew how important it was to leave enough room for the other crew members to get in touch with the family or to make sure that their PR communication will be successful. All this you learn, how to behave in a crew and so on, but I just wanted to highlight through this uh, small talk that there are a lot of similarities between the way we have to live and to work in uh, NEMO, the Aquarius module, and what you do on the space station. It's very done on purpose by NASA, they do it very well. Uh, and there are a lot of things that I have heard or, or witnessed myself from the Eurocom control room when they say, oh, that's what, what the crew experience right now. And I was so amazed to discover how many situations like that I could leave myself and experience myself in NEMO. So this is definitely a very good training for our crew members. Okay. Thanks, Harry. We have like three minutes for questions. Any questions? Okay, now don't talk and force some more. <laughs> How does the selection actually go on? Are these regular 
astronaut candidates or are they a different pool of people? Well, the selection is done by the different agencies. So NASA selects the astronaut that goes to, to the next mission. The, if the Canadian Space Agency or JAXA are involved, they do the same. If it's ESA, ESA decides who they send. That was one here. Yeah, it's, it's something that NASA tries to implement at least once a year. Sometimes they are more successful, they do it twice, but they try to do it once. So all the other were astronauts, so you were the only non-astronauts. What was the difference between the astronauts and you? You already mentioned uh, like the timeline, were there other things that were different, where maybe some, some things that you had an advantage because you weren't an astronaut? Well, <coughs> no, uh, not really. I mean, there was, the, the difference is that, uh, uh, let's say, the, the, the other astronauts uh, were very kind because they, they didn't make a difference. They considered me as a cr member of the crew and it was very, very fine. Uh, on the other side, I had uh, not their astronaut experience, but I had the training experience, I had the other ex operational experience, and this is something that they were really aware that I could bring as an asset to the team. My only difference from a personal perspective was like I was thinking, oh, don't screw it up. Make sure that you do it. I mean, you are doing an EVA, even if you are an EVA instructor. You go outside and you do an EVA with Randy Bresnik, who is a commander of the mission. He has done an EVA in space. He knows all these rules and how it works. Don't slow down. Don't, don't do something that will make the EVA not as, ex as powerful and as efficient as expected. So this was my main concern. It was an additional pressure on me. But that's part of the of the deal. Okay, great. Thank you very much again.